heart. What a joy. Hallelujah. Christ is Lord. Because he lives, we can face each day. Today, tomorrow, whatever is to come, God sent his son. died and you rose again for each one of us and we can have that assurance when we surrender to you you are alive you are our lord hallelujah praise the lord our scripture reading this morning is 1 corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 to 23 but if it is preached that christ has been raised from the dead how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people are most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since death came through a man, 
the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes those who belong to him. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you that you had such a plan for this world. Your love was so great that despite its brokenness, rebellion, turning away from you, you had a plan, a plan to redeem, to bring back the world to yourself. Every tribe, every nation, every people group, every, every person, young person, older person and child, whom you love and whom your love pursues to the ends of the earth, to the end of eternity. Father, I thank you this morning that we can celebrate the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Changes the world, changes everything for us. Especially those of us who believe because we know the truth in you. You have revealed it to us. We claim nothing for ourselves. We claim no special knowledge, no special wisdom or understanding that would make us any different except we have received what you've given. And we thank you for that. And in the light of the cross, in the light of the empty tomb and the ascended Christ and the risen Lord, we pray for the world we live in. We pray for the peace in Ukraine. As your people in that nation celebrate Easter, may resurrection come for them. May life come after death. May peace come after war. May light come after the darkness of these days. And a rebuilding and even greater foundation, even greater nation than before. Comfort those who mourn the death of loved ones. For those in Turkey and Syria, mourning the death of their whole communities and whole families, the whole villages wiped out. We pray for them, Father, that they might know the risen Lord, the power of the resurrection, that you bring all things together and make it work for good to them that love you and are called according to your purpose. May your church be strong. May your people be servants of their neighbours. May they love in the name of Jesus. For us here in Sunbury, we pray. For your body this morning, as in different places we're celebrating the, the risen Lord, we thank you for Good Friday. We thank you for the service we had together. We thank you for the unity of the body of Christ and that today we serve one Lord, one faith, one God and Father who's over all and in all and through all. And to him be all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. What would it, what would it matter um, if Christ was not raised from the dead? Most of the world doesn't actually care and they seem to be doing okay, don't they? A lot of people in Sunbury are living without thinking about Jesus being raised from the dead. Uh, if it mattered, they might be in church this morning. I don't say just Baptist, but they would be somewhere celebrating the risen Christ and matter to them somehow. See, most of the world doesn't care what we think about Jesus dying on the cross, why we think he died, why we think he even rose from the dead. It doesn't matter. It's not even a question anymore. When I was a teenager, I used to argue about the scientific facts and whether you could prove it or otherwise. And it was always about imperial evidence. Now it doesn't matter. Relative truth is just whatever you want it to be. So the Christian church around the world spends this weekend celebrating something that happened 2,000 years ago at the other, on the other side of the world for most of us. And we claim, and we claim that it is absolutely vital, it's a clear declaration of God's intention to redeem this world. We say it's important. But does it matter that Jesus was actually raised from the dead? Does it matter? And I'm talking about the historical reality of Jesus being raised from the dead. You see, there are some in the Christian family who are a bit embarrassed about our claims, our claims that, that this Christ, this Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem in a manger, laid in a manger after he was born, he wasn't born in a manger, died on a cross, buried in a tomb, raised again on the third day, that by faith in him, there is an exclusive right to come to the Father by no other means except through Jesus. And the fact that he died and rose again is central to that gospel story. That's what we claim. But there's some people who are embarrassed by that. And they're, and they're Christians. They claim a Christian understanding. But what they will say is, well, you know, this Christ event is like an experience of, of spiritual experience. Other people have different spiritualities, but we're all the same in the end. 
I remember hearing that in college. My last year of college, we were studying a man called Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich said that the disciples of Jesus didn't actually, didn't actually see Jesus in the flesh alive. What they were experiencing was the presence of Jesus. And they didn't want his presence to be lost. And they told the story about Jesus appearing to them because they wanted to capture for all time the fact that Christ was amongst us as believers. Sounded kind of plausible except for one thing. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, If Jesus be not raised from the dead, we of all men are most to be pitied. Our faith is empty, our preaching is useless. Now, far be it from me to say that some preaching is not useless, right? Don't say amen too quick on that one. It's sensitive. I'm going on holidays. It's all right. But there are some people who don't think that it's so important. They don't see the importance of, of what we're talking about when we, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And I want, I want today to really put this before you that what Paul is saying is that Jesus appeared to Peter, to the apostles, to James and the other disciples, even to 500 at one stage all together. And then he says, and he appeared to me as one born abnormally. The physical resurrection of Jesus and his ascension does not mean that he not, doesn't appear to people, but it's a different kind of appearance. Stephen saw Jesus as he was being martyred. There were people in Corinth who apparently believed that there was no such possibility of resurrection, that it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't even possible. And Paul was saying, well, if it's not possible, then Christ wasn't raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, and this is the point that he makes in this whole passage, if Christ has not been raised, then these things follow. And you'll find that this is a, if, you, if you're a student of scripture, you'll find this is very, uh, it's a very key part of reading scripture. There's an if and then. It happens a lot. It's in covenant kind of terminology. If you do this, then that will happen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, I will, then I will. There's a consequence that follows from an action. If Christ has not been raised, then these things follow. One, our preaching is useless. Your faith is useless. Our witness is false, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Paul had written earlier in, in, uh, in the epistle to the Corinthians, and we read this last week, where he said, I decided to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. In other words, the preaching of the gospel will be centered in this event of the cross that Jesus actually died, he was buried, and now he wants to say as well, adding to that and making sure we understand it's part of the same story that he rose again from the dead. Paul argues from the specific to the general. If there's no resurrection, then Christ is not raised. But if Christ has not been raised, all of these other things are useless. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's validation of what Jesus did on the cross. What Paul is saying is that we've been preaching We've been preaching this message that by faith in Jesus, who died on the cross in your place, that your sins might be forgiven, you can have a relationship with God. That's the only way you can have a relationship with God. And he says, if, but if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then that message is useless. That preaching doesn't affect anything. It doesn't make any change at all. See, you can have a spirituality today that says, I kind of believe in the universe. People talk to me about the universe must have my back. <laughs> That's great. But what, you're surrounded by the universe, are you? You know, the stars are behind you and under you and the sun above you. What does that mean? For us who believe in Jesus, the one who created the universe, has our soul. He has our future. He has our eternity in his hands. The gospel very clearly says only by faith in Jesus Christ can you have salvation. Can you have redemption? Can you have reconciliation? Can you have relationship with the Father? There's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. And there's only one way to follow Jesus, and that's by his death and resurrection. The preaching of the apostle was founded on this very rock, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, raised again the third day, so that we might be forgiven and the old life put away, we might live in Christ. See, this is the heart of the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. We can say it easily, right? But Paul says, if it's not true, then not only is our preaching useless, but your faith is useless. In other words, whatever you're trusting in, 
it doesn't actually work. It doesn't work. Why? Because you've got no connection with God. I mean, the whole purpose of faith is a connection with the living God. It's not just a faith that something happened. It's not just trusting that there was an event that took place or that there's a God out there somewhere in the universe. This faith that we're talking about is a living connection between you and the living God, between God as Father, between you and the person who says, I love you and you're my child. Will you receive that? That's what faith is. And it's a total reliance upon that God, that this God who in Jesus Christ demonstrated his love by giving him to die on a cross for us that we might be forgiven. That's, this is what faith means. It doesn't, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a mental ascent to some doctrine. This was the argument of the Reformation, if you like. One of the, the major arguments of the Reformers was that faith is not ascent to, but trust in, reliance upon. The faith is... The faith that saves us, the faith that restores us to a relationship with God is based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross in his death and in his resurrection. Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion, would have us believe that we're all deluded. But that we really don't know what we're talking about. But you can't have a real hope if your sins aren't forgiven. And if you don't know how your sins can be forgiven, if you don't know how rebellion can be wiped out between us and God, then you haven't got a relationship with him. There's no way that you can live in that relationship. The point of sins being forgiven is restoration to God the Father forever. And faith is about trusting God and believing his word. If an absolute key part of that witness is Jesus is alive again, making promises to us that we will be with him, and if he didn't rise from the dead then all of that comes to nothing. Your faith is useless. It leads only to the grave. It makes no difference to life. Third thing Paul says, if Christ was not raised from the dead, he said, our witness is false. We're actually not just deluded, we're lying. We're telling an untruth. I think I've told you this story, but it's Resurrection Sunday, so, you know, and I'm going on holidays, so you don't have to hear it next week. There's a man called David, and David attended our church in Diamond Valley Baptist and he had been attending the church for seven years. He was leading a Bible study group. He brought his wife to church every week because she wanted to come, primarily. And when I get to sat, sit down with him, I asked him this question. I said, are you, are you a believer in Jesus? Are you a follower of Christ? He said, no. I said, that's, that's amazing. Like, how did you become a Bible study leader? Well, nobody else in the group wanted to lead the discussion. All I have to do is ask questions. So why have you kept coming to church? He said, well, my wife wanted to come. She doesn't have a license, so I brought her. You're a very faithful man. So you've heard about Jesus rising from the dead. You've heard, you've heard the gospel. You've, you've heard about Christ. Why haven't you become a follower of Christ? And he said something very interesting. He said, because I don't believe that Jesus can be raised from the dead. And in that, he put his finger on something that is absolutely true for us today. That if Jesus is not raised from the dead, we haven't got a faith. We haven't got a religion. We haven't got anything. We're better off to follow some path of enlightenment and trying to live a good life. But to say we trust in a God who says in his word that he's given us life through Jesus Christ who was raised again from the dead and through him, and through him we can have life forever. There's life after death. There's a justification. There's a righteousness that follows this life. No matter what happens here, there's a God of justice which makes it all right in the end. That truth will be gone and you'll just end up dying where you are. We're lying if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. We bear witness to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, how many know when Queen Elizabeth stopped being queen? Does anyone know the, the time? When she died. Exactly. When she died. I don't even know the date of that, but I do know this. She was no longer queen, but when she took her last breath. That's why we've got King Charles, isn't that true? We have a replacement. Why? Because Queen Elizabeth, sadly, has passed away. Do we celebrate King of Kings and Lord of Lords, or is he no longer king? See, if Jesus be not raised from the dead, then he's not our king. He has no right to rule. He has no authority over us because he's dead. He's passed away. But if he be raised from the dead, then we bear witness to the King of Kings. We bear witness to the Lord of Lords. We are talking about someone who is as live as we are maybe even more so. Jesus was crowned king. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Father gave him a name that's above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have the privilege today, if you know this truth, if you understand what I'm saying this morning, if you understand this scripture, you have the privilege of entering into that relationship where you bow the knee and confess Jesus Christ willingly and gladly in anticipation of that promise being true that you will live forever in the kingdom of our God and Father. Amen? Amen. How good is that? It's nonsense for people who don't believe it, though. Absolute nonsense. And I have a problem with that. I've spent 43 years preaching this gospel, and if it's not true, folks, if it's not true, yeah, I've wasted my time. But then you've turned up too, so you can't point the finger at me, can you? <laughs> but that's how foolish it is. This message of the cross, this fact that some person would die on the cross, and even more crazy that he would rise again from the dead. David said to me, I, I can't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I said, that's a bit of a problem, Dave, isn't it? Have you heard about it? Or have you read it? He said, yeah, I've read it. I've been to every Easter service. I said, so you read the Bible and it says, Jesus, the tomb was empty. They touched him. They ate with him. Thomas was a doubter. He put his fingers into his hands. He put his fingers into his side. And Jesus looked at him and said, Thomas, do you believe because you see me? Blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's you and me, by the way. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. But Thomas did that for us so that we'd know that Jesus actually rose again from the dead, that he was alive, that he was well, that he was there. Jesus was crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. But it's, it's foolishness, you see, unless you believe that. And I said to David, well, if you've read it and you, you've heard it, what's stopping you believe it? He said, just, it just can't be true. Like, people, don't, people don't just rise from the dead. I said, well, here's the problem. The Bible says it's true. There's a record of it. The resurrection of Jesus has more evidence to being a historical fact than most of the things you believe about the past. So you can take my word for that or Lee, read Lee Strobel's book, A Case for Christ, if you want all the evidence. But um, the Bible says it's true and you say it's not. Now, if the Bible is God's word and God says it's true and you're saying it's not, you've got a problem with God, haven't you? Who are you calling a liar here? Just, David, just, just bear with me, all right? I don't want to insult you, but you're actually probably taking a stance against what God says. He said, yeah, that's true. He said, well, what, why don't you do this? Just to see if you can break through somehow. Just pray this prayer. Say, God, I'm sorry that I've called you a liar. I really do want to know the truth. <laughs> I do want to know the truth. You don't, you don't have to commit to the truth, just that you want to know it. You're prepared to suspend your unbelief long enough to see if God shows you the truth. He prayed that prayer with me. He went home. Nothing had changed. Next time I saw David, he was so excited. I said, what's the matter? He said, Jesus is alive. <laughs> I told you that before. He said, but it's true. <laughs> what happened? He said, I don't know, but I know it's true. And you know, David was so keen for people to know that Jesus was alive, that he, he helped us get a big bus. He wanted a bus for the church. He wanted to have this kitchen bus. And we, had this, we painted it white. And in letters, iridescent red letters across the side of the bus, David had this statement, Jesus is the answer. And everywhere that bus went, Jesus is the answer. We got known in the, in the whole district. In fact, the fires came uh, and we were using those buses and it got known as the Jesus bus. So here comes the Jesus bus. Because David met the living Jesus. Paul says, if Christ is not raised, then your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And that's the biggest problem. That's the biggest problem because every philosophy and religion of man leaves man in his original condition. Struggling, striving, working hard, trying to be good, trying to do the right thing. People tell me that I talk to about faith, they say, you know, I'm not a bad person. Relatively, of course, who is? Are we talking about people who are mass murderers? Are we talking about people who take an axe to their neighbours? No, we're talking about people who are basically good in some way. But the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we will not and we will never attain to the righteousness, to the right relationship with God based on our efforts. We need, we need what Jesus did. And if he wasn't raised from the dead, then we don't know that what he did to forgive us our sins was accomplished. It's important that he was raised because that means we know that what he did on the cross was finished. That God himself, the Father, said, 
I am pleased with what you've done. I, I accept your faith and trust in me, your absolute obedience as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And you raised him from the dead. That's the story we're telling. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men, says Paul. Why is that? Well, Christians living in the West, that's, I'm not sure how true that is. Because we, we're quite, we get quite comfortable. I, I've even said it myself. Well, if there's no life after death, I still had a good life, right? It wasn't the experience of the early Christians. It wasn't the experience of the Apostle Paul. To claim Christ, to stand up for Jesus, to say that you would only bow the knee to Jesus Christ and not to Caesar could cost you your life. And you'd be persecuted and hounded and executed more often than not. And Paul says, if it's not true, we ought to be pitied because we're living a lie for no good reason. I'll leave it there. No, I don't want to leave you there. I want to affirm to you that we are not wasting our belief. We're not telling lies. We're not hoping in vain. The sacrifice Christ made was not was not just dying in a grave and staying there, but he rose again that we might have a saviour, a lord, have forgiveness, freedom. That injustice is answered in Jesus because that which he suffered of an injustice in humanity is satisfied in Christ, is satisfied in God's economy, in God's resurrection. There's an answer to injustice. If Richard Dawkins is right, then we're all deluded. But if we're right, and perhaps there's a different kind of delusion, a delusion that says there is no God and he doesn't matter anyway. Now, that's all well and good. Most of you would say amen so far, despite my sarcasm here and there. You'd say amen to all of that, right? Amen. But is it possible to live, even as a Christian, to live with a belief as a Christian, with, with stating what we just said, but live as if it's not true? Now you're getting here to see application, right? If Jesus be not raised from the dead, we of all men are most to be pitied. Our faith is in vain. But what if we live as if he's not risen? What if we live without the consequence in our life as if Christ is really alive? Some of you may know the name Jordan Peterson. Don't know if he's a Christian or not. He was asked the question recently, do you believe in God? He said, I choose to live as if God exists. <laughs> Interesting answer. I don't know what kind of God he has and how he's planning that, but... <clears throat> it made me think I choose to live as if Christ is risen from the dead Amen. I choose to live as if Jesus died in my place has taken my sins has restored a relationship between me and God and has given me life eternal I choose to live as if that's true now you can live as if it's not true or you can live as if it doesn't matter and that's the point of today is we want to come to that kind of application that Jesus challenged his disciples James says, faith without works is dead. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? In other words, what's the point of you saying you believe something if the actions of your life don't follow the commitment to that belief? If there's not a consequential behavior change or life change or, or actions that follow from that very truth, then what's the point of saying it? You see, for most of our neighbors, for many of our friends, the fact that Jesus is alive today makes no difference to them. It will one day, but not today. It doesn't seem to make any difference. They can live as if life's all good. But if you follow Jesus, if you take his name, if you believe in the risen Lord, when you come before him, he will acknowledge you as his child. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, if you've served him. Jesus said, some will come before him and say to him, did, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name, Lord? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. And this, is, this is where it gets through, where the pointy end of the gospel is, if this is true, then you believing it means you've actually acknowledged that Christ is Lord of your life. You're going to live that way. And it's the living of that in obedience to the Father that shows that you have faith. And again, it's a gift. You, you get a revelation of God. You get a revelation of what God has done through Jesus. It comes to you as something God has made known to you. But in making it known to you, he's calling you into a place of obedience. He's calling you and me to live as if knowing this Jesus is alive makes a difference to our everyday decisions. 
and everything we do and every value we have and every thought we have and every, every part of our possessions and every part of our lives matters because Jesus is alive and he's Lord. Jesus didn't save us to live an indulgent life. He saved us to live a sacrificial, obedient life. And therefore, discover, as Paul says, I want to share in his suffering so that I may know Christ and his resurrection. If you want to know the resurrection of Jesus, you can only know it through the cross. If you want to know Jesus as he is, the risen Lord, you can only know it through death to self. You can't know it any other way. You can't have resurrection without death, in other words. You can't, have, you can't have one without the other. You can't pass through to resurrection experience and life by saying, well, I, just, I think I'll just change my mind here and just do a different thing. It is actually death to self. There's something about you that has to die with Jesus on the cross. That's what baptism is about. De dead and buried with Christ, we're raised to a new life with him. There's something different that happens. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we're to be pitied. But if we live as if Christ is not raised from the dead, we're more to be pitied. If we live knowing what we know, but act as if it's not true, how foolish are we? How foolish are we? It'd be better to be an unbeliever than that and to be a confessed believer but not live in the truth of who Jesus is. I'm sort of proud and I'm Probably shouldn't say this, but proud of the Craig motto, a crest of arms. It's in, it's in the Latin. It goes something like, Viva et Deo, vives. Live for God and you'll have life. Live for God and you'll have life. Live by faith in the resurrected Jesus, in the God who reveals himself through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Live for him by faith and you'll have life. Father, we thank you for the life we can have in Jesus. Grant us a spirit of repentance and faith so that where we let self rule, where we, whether we're teenagers or older folk, allow rebellion to come into our hearts to do our own thing rather than listening to the voice of the Spirit, forgive us. And grant us the faith to follow the risen Lord in this life, not seeing him with our eyes, not touching him like the early disciples did, not being there at the empty tomb and seeing him, as it were, just risen from the dead, but knowing, knowing that we know that what you say is true and your word can be relied upon. We put our faith in the risen Lord. We bow the knee and we say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. To you be the glory, the honour and the praise, both now and forever, for you are the risen Lord. Amen.
Jesus.